Three years ago, a few companies got together in a sort of ad hoc way because we had concerns about the high oil price. Uh, and we decided to do a sort of business risk assessment of the peak oil issue. Um, and going into that exercise, the companies that were spread you know, pretty much across British industry were not all of the view that there was definitely a problem, but the thinking was this is a very high consequence issue and um, is it a high prob probability issue as well? Uh, I thought it was, and one or two of the others did as well. But by the end of the exercise, a year of looking at the uh, risk assessment, we were all of the view that this is a very high consequence and very high risk issue, and that we need to respond to it proactively, governments, companies, communities. Uh, and that was our message in our first report in 2008, um, reiterated in our second report in 2010. And we think that this problem is actually as bad, if not worse, than the credit crunch. We say this in the foreword to the chief executives and the chairman of the companies to our second report because it's going to come down on a world economy that is oil-dependent, nay, oil-addicted, uh, as a great surprise when oil supply begins to descend, maybe even collapse, um, and, you know, we, th this is a, a huge whistle that we're trying to blow. So why isn't anyone listening? I think that there are two main reasons. The um, counter-argument is very strong, and it comes from, you know, people you would expect to be correct in their analysis, BP and uh, some of the other big oil companies. So they're listened to, um, as, as they should be, because it's a risk assessment exercise, and we're weighing arguments here. I think very definitely there's a sort of desperation to believe the comforting narrative if your choice is the uncomfortable narrative and the comforting one. And, I mean, I, I personally find that everywhere, in government, in industry. You know, people do not want to believe that there is a problem with the lifeblood of, of modern economies. They just don't. You were talking about peak oil a while ago. Let's get beyond that. What is the oil crunch? The oil crunch is when global supply fails to meet demand and starts to drop, and arguably we fear starts to drop uh, so fast that you'd almost call it a collapse. And what our economies are locked into is the inherent assumption that actually demand keeps growing, as it does, fed primarily by these days by India, China, and the Middle East, and it'll just go right on growing, and somehow we'll be able to keep the supply track growing with demand. And this is what we're saying. We're saying that that narrative is no longer believable. There are so many problems with conventional oil and unconventional oil that on the massive balance of probabilities, by 2015 at the latest, in the view of the industry task force, there will be a descent of global oil production. And that will cause a crunch. It will cause the price to go through the roof. It will cause price volatility and... Um, all the downsides that come with a fabulously expensive and, in some cases, simply unavailable oil. How, what date did you say? It sounded pretty soon. 2015, at the latest, is the task force's um, belief based on our latest analysis, but it could happen uh, earlier than that and conceivably quite a bit earlier than that. We hope we're wrong in this analysis but that's our belief. When you say it's a crisis, what do you actually think will happen in 2015? Our worst-case analysis is that it'll be, for many oil-importing countries like Britain, um, it, it will be actually more of a, an energy famine than a crisis because, in our view, uh, there's no conspiracy here, it's that there's a cultural problem, as there was with the credit crunch. A bunch of bankers managed to persuade themselves that, you know, they'd found a new way of creating wealth. In fact, they'd found a new way of crashing the global economy. So, um, similarly with this crisis, you, you know that there'll be a sweeping realisation, including in the oil-producing countries, that, you know, crikey, we've got this wrong. Uh, there isn't as much down there. We can't get it up as quickly as we thought we could. And uh, then oil-producing countries are going to start husbanding their resources, which is code for keeping the oil for themselves. Now, if that happens, you then have oil-importing countries facing refineries that just can't get enough oil delivered. Uh, and that really is serious. 
So I, I think, you know, we really will be t- tested, uh, many countries, in this crisis that's coming. Um, and, you know, we, we will have to mobilise the survival technologies and strategies very quickly. Good news is we know we can do it. We did it with tanks and aircraft in the Second World War, uh, and we can do it with uh, the clean energy stuff that we're going to need. The oil price will go very high, it'll be very volatile, and it'll be very, very difficult for airlines, as they are configured today, to function in anything like the form that they that they have now. It's not as though they're not troubled with 80 to $90 oil, but, you know, um, in three figures... It, it's going to really make it next to impossible for them to, to operate. Now, on to what the, um, the other side would say. Won't we just find more oil? The peak of discovery was way back in the mid-1960s with oil, and you can see it dropping ever since. So that, of course, it fluctuates, and you have some years that are better than others. But we will never discover as much oil as we did in the 1960s. And so you see the production coming up um, and continuing to rise ahead of the rates. If you can imagine two curves, so discovery goes like this and falls and then production rises. And we think the peak is imminent and it's inevitable that there's going to be a descent the other side. It's just a question of when. That's another challenge for us in this in this uh, debate, you know, people say the peak oil theory and the peak oil theorists. There's no theory here. This is inevitable. It's just a debate about timing. And if you're BP or one of the other oil companies, you're, uh, you're looking at a timing that's for the peak that's off in the future, the 2030s, not on our watch. And if you believe the companies in the task force, we're saying it's much sooner than that, 2015 at the latest. What do you think of the IEA's latest projections? They have a graph where oil production continues to rise gently for another 20 years. What do you think of that? I don't think there's a snowball's chance in hell of that uh, graph being realised, and and I really do believe that many of the people in the IEA actually share that view but don't feel able to say so. What is your best hope and worst fear for what will happen? My best hope is that um, the British government first and then other governments will listen to these growing um, voices in industry who are blowing whistles about premature peak oil and actually do something about it proactively, by which I mean um, accelerate things they're doing already for climate reasons, but really go for particularly demand management. And if we do that in the next few years as an emergency, as though mobilising for war, we can soften the landing of this problem, push it out into the future, make it less intense a crisis when it does inevitably hit. That's my best hope. I I don't actually think there's much chance of that happening. My worst fear is that we simply find out who's right, uh, and though we pray that we're wrong in the task force, we uh, are proved right in this worst-case scenario, and um, there is so steep a, a collapse of global oil production that you would call it um, uh, so, so, so steep a descent that you would call it a collapse and, and that that will hit society very hard and the coherence of society then um, comes under pressure. And in my very worst case analysis, of course, the coherence doesn't hold and, and you have um, real anarchy on the streets, and I, I pray that's not going to be the outcome to this drama, but um, it's certainly on the cards.